Did I get to talk to you about the adolescent brain today? Or the other title for this is normally, what were they thinking? It's kind of um, the, and I'm sure we've all had those questions and conversations at times. So, um, you know, I do work for the juvenile justice system, um, but the presentation I'm giving you today is about teens in general, right, and the teenage brain in general. And so uh, I will highlight when I want to kind of emphasize that there are certain populations that are even at greater risk, but this applies to all teens, and some of you are going to argue that it applies to your husband and boyfriend <laughs> and all of that, or, you know, wife, uh, you know, whatever. So, um, but I am a bit sarcastic, and that's partly juvenile justice doing, partly just my nature. So... If I offend anybody, um, just write it at the bottom of the evaluation and um, I'll try to be sensitive to that the next time. But um, so what I wanna do first is when we're talking about the teenage brain, uh, you know, that information can be really pretty dry. So um, I would like to start off with kind of a really tangible example of how the teenage brain is different than the adult brain. And I'm really kind of excited. There's now more and more research to kind of confirm what we've just known for decades, right? Um, and that research has been over the past 10 years. And because of that research, we've had some significant changes in regards to um, laws. And not always in Texas, but we've had some significant changes nationally in regards to laws. So let me kind of give you that tangible example first. Okay, so um, this is uh, my face when they told me I'd be presenting on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> after lunch, right? It's like, okay, but they provided snacks for you guys, so I don't see a ton of caffeine. Is that in the back somewhere? Okay, so they're good, okay. All right, so, um, but actually what they did is um, some wise researchers just decided to do study where they um, showed pictures of facial expressions to both young people and adults, right? Um, and these facial expressions were pretty um, straightforward. So these were feelings like happy, mad, sad, afraid, nothing complicated. Um, but while they were showing these pictures of facial expressions, they hooked all of these participants up to an MRI, right? which is really kind of interesting, because what they wanted to see is, do the brains, when they're considering information, function differently? So when they asked adults, what are you thinking? I mean, what is this person thinking? This is the part of the brain that lit up for the adults. This is the frontal core, the frontal lobe in the brain. We're gonna talk a lot about that frontal lobe and what that entails. But this is what we call an aggregate MRI. So it's basically they took all of the adults and kind of highlighted those areas that tended to be hot spots. And, you know, and that's where it was for adults, mainly in that area. So when they looked at the happy, mad, sad, they thought about it before they gave their answer what the person's feeling, that's the part of the brain that lit up. So the interesting part is, look at the teenage brain. Okay, number one, it did light up. Yay, right, we're really happy about that. So, phew, okay. So, but, but look how drastically different in regards to how the brain functioned, right? And this, the beauty of this is that it gives you a very tangible example that while, you know, teenagers look like adults, sometimes they're taller than us, sometimes they're more physically developed than us, their brains are not functioning in the same way even with the same information, right? Okay, so this was a nice kind of piece of information to say, yes, they are different, so, but what does that look like? The other interesting part when they did this study was that um, they looked at just kind of the response, right? These were very straightforward questions. These were happy, mad, sad, afraid. So in the adults, they pretty much nailed this. It wasn't complicated, right? What is this person feeling? Happy, mad, sad. They nailed it almost 100% of the time. But the teens, when they answered that question, they were correct or incorrect, depending on whether you're you know, half full, half empty person, they were correct half of the time. Half, right? Does that surprise you as you interact with young people that they get a facial expression half of the time? I mean, how many of you had those conversations where you're talking to a young person, whether your own child or kind of someone you're working with, and and you're like trying to emphasize that something is important and something is serious and then you know, two weeks later they go and do exactly what you were talking not to do, right? And you're like, we talked about this. And they're like, oh, I didn't think it was that big of a deal, right? You ever have those conversations? And you're like, we, I gave you a PowerPoint presentation on this. I wrote it out. I mean, what else do you... Or have you ever had the opposite where you're talking to a young person and you're just having this kind of casual conversation with them, you know, talking about something important. And they're like, why are you so mad at me? Why are you always picking on me? And you're like, you know, I'm not mad. 
I'm actually really proud of you or really happy. And they're like, you're always upset. And you're like, you know. So think about this. If they read the facial expressions incorrectly half of the time, what's the likelihood they're going to respond correctly to the stimulus, to the situation? Right? So if you're, they're half correct, and if they respond correctly only half of the time, that means in any situation, they're going to be wrong three quarters of the time. Right? And I, I'm kind of exaggerating. But does that make sense, what I'm saying? So, but yet again, this person looks like an adult. They have language that definitely sounds like an adult. You know, they do activities that seem very adult-like. Um, but their brains are not yet there. So what we're going to do is kind of walk through the development of the brain. But really highlight that part, that time period between teen and adult years. And then talk about some strategies on how to kind of recognize when someone's struggling or when someone is kind of pretty much on target. Does that sound OK to everybody? Like I said, feel free. So volume's good. Everything's good like that. OK, all right. Feel free to ask questions. OK, so what I do want to emphasize is that we're talking about kind of brain development. But please know that this is not a fixed time period, right? that the brain is an amazing organ, and it's incredibly adaptable, elastic, flexible. I mean, we see um, individuals that you know have lived a long life who may have a brain injury pretty late in life, and they're able to recover um, things like speech. You know, It takes time, um, but they're able to do that. So know that the brain always finds a way if you nurture it and support it. And that's the key that we're going to talk about is how much you nurture and kind of support brain development. Um, the other thing that I want to emphasize is that um, you know, it's not really that the brain size is growing when I talk about growth in the brain. It's about those connections that are growing. Right? The brain is pretty much the size it is when you're born. It's those connections that change over time. That's why the baby's head looks like it's a giant bobble head. I mean, that's the si it's the size. But, how it develops and how those connections go is what kind of changes over time. <coughs> I'm trying to cough in the right mic. OK, so if you can take a moment and put down your food or um, your phones, you know, or just kind of set it in your lap, I'd like for you to take both hands, make a fist. And now I'm testing for impulse control. I'm going to see who actually punches somebody or doesn't. <laughs> put your hands together. OK, that's your brain. Really, that is about the size of your brain. Your head may be bigger than that, but it's all just bone, hair. OK, and that's actually almost about the shape of your brain. Now, some of you guys are trying to expand your brain, you know, whatever way. Yeah, there's no expansions in this kind of world. OK, so but then the way that the brain works is that it develops from the bottom up and the inside out, right? Bottom up, inside out. So you can put your hands down now and go back to eating. So bottom up, inside out. OK, so that bottom part of the brain, we're not going to talk a lot about today, because that's the part of the brain that's kind of responsible for physical functioning, right, in regards to like heart rate, respiratory, blood pressure. So if you have someone that's struggling in those kind of areas, um, I mean, that's someone that you're more working with like in an ALE setting, in a school setting, you know, um, kind of helping them just kind of do daily functions. So that's not kind of where we're going to talk about today. Um, but the interesting part about the way the brain works is that the next part of the brain to develop, after you figure out your you know, bodily functions and you kind of start to get coordinated, and is the emotional center of the brain, the bottom up, inside out. So that's that middle part of the brain. And the irony is that what develops next. And that is responsible for things like aggression and attachment and sexual desire, right? So that comes next. And we see that, right? We see that in children where you know, they're starting to go, he's my boyfriend, or you know, having these kind of or these attachments and, and kind of connections and learning these different kind of social cues in their world. That happens next. And the interesting part about that time period is also we understand now that um, the emotional center of the brain is also highly connected to long-term memory, right? And so. Um, you're going to tend to remember those things that are more emotionally significant to you. And if you, so if you're working with a young person, how do you get something to stick is that you make it important, emotionally important to them in the work that you do. You know, um, we talk a lot about consequences. We talk a lot about kind of you know, practicing and strategies. But if you can make a personal connection for them in regards to that concept that you're trying to get them to understand, then that's going to help, you know. Other than the kind of the random memorization, and I always kind of test this. Who knows the rest of this? Eight, six, seven, five. Okay. So that puts everyone that should be 
enrolling for AARP any day now in one group and then everybody else. Okay. All right. So I'm already a member. So, all right. So, but the last part of the brain to develop, which is the top part of the brain, remember bottom up, inside out, that's the cognitive center of the brain. And that's the irony here is that what comes first is the emotional center, those attachments, connections, aggression, all that kind of stuff. And then we figure out how to control it. Kind of makes sense, right? You know, you have to get the horse before you can learn how to ride. So, but that's kind of where we're at. And so, and the interesting part that we understand now about that part of the brain is that part of the brain, the cognitive center of the brain, really doesn't solidify. Um, and I don't mean like a, it's always on target and hits every point, but it really doesn't fully develop until about 23, 25 years of age. Not that it doesn't turn on before then, and not that everybody's turns on by then. Like I said, we all look at our spouses and you know our own children. But for the most part, that's when things to kind of really start to gel. And when you're starting to kind of apply things. And I don't know if you can remember your own time around that age or if you kind of, kind of look at people around you, but that's kind of really where they, people get into a groove and they kind of have a clear vision of who they are as an individual, right? And also understand kind of the the thinking the, you know, about making choices and kind of working through those more carefully. Any questions so far? OK. So the other interesting part about the brain is that we all know about this growth spurt. I mean, we all kind of focus on early brain development, right? You go to any target, and you see rows and rows and rows of baby development stuff, right? You see red and black stuff, rainbow colored stuff. You see baby Einstein stuff. You know, now you can order online all sorts of apps for your, you know, tablets and all this kind of stuff so that your two-month-old can start reading. You know, we're all kind of, I'm waiting for it when they're reading, like, from the belly and they have it recorded or something like that. So, do you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, we're all focused on that. And that is one of the growth spurts. That is one of those times in brain development where there's a bunch of connections being made, right? There's a bunch of connection options, and those connections are being made. So that's that first growth spurt, which is about in utero to about 18 months. The interesting part that I don't think a lot of people realize is that there's a second growth spurt. There's a second opportunity during childhood where more connections are kind of available so that you can start kind of developing the brain even more. And that's 10 to 13 years of age. But let's think about kind of in our world, what happens at about 10 to 13 years of age? When do we stop really kind of paying attention to what time your child goes to bed, right? When do we stop having control of kind of what time they go to bed, right? Not that in their bed is one thing, but when they actually go to sleep, right? So we oftentimes hear 10 to 13 years of age. When are we less able to kind of manage their diet as a child, right? 10 to 13 years of age. I mean, you know, all these things kind of fifth, sixth grade, I mean, things start to kind of take off for them and we're encouraging their independence. But if you think about, these are when all those connections are kind of popping up. You know, this is when they need to be at their maximum in regards to nutrition, in regards to sleep, all of these things, right? Um, and think about at-risk populations. When are they less, you know, attended to and less, you know, supervised? When does that happen? Probably around this age. So let's add to that, when do you think, especially for those that are most troubled or most at risk, when are they most likely to start using substances? Right? I know in our system, and I know that's a very small subset of the general population, our kids will normally say that they started drinking about 12, 11 years old, started smoking cigarettes at about that time. So, so you're not only not providing the, um, the nourishment needed for the brain to grow, but you may be introducing toxins that can negatively impact what is already even there, right? So just know that that's really a critical age. But just as important as those age, those growth spurts, are the, what we call the pruning stages. And what I mean by pruning stages is it's what our, we call the use it or lose it stage, right? And we all understand that concept. But let me kind of explain it in kind of how it works in the brain in regards to these pathways. So I want to get from point A to point B, right? And that may be I want to learn how to ride a bike, or I want to learn how to talk to a girl, you know, whatever it is that I want to do. So the first time that I traverse this point A to point B, I mean, this is like a wilderness, right? It's overgrown, there's, you know, trees everywhere, it's a jungle, does that make sense? 
So, so the first time I'm wa- walking through this, it's a, it's a battle. I'm like trying to, you know, knock things down and kind of create a path. And we see that, right? Just even in riding a bike. It's not like, okay, so the next time I go, it's a little bit better, but it's still overgrown. So I go, but every time I take this path, it gets a little bit smoother. It gets a little bit more automatic. So it turns from this overgrown path to maybe a dirt path to maybe a sidewalk. You're going to love me for this. I'm going back and forth. Um, to maybe a highway, right? To eventually like a super highway. So now I can get from point A to point B like that, right? That's what it's like when we're talking about that pruning stage. But let's say I don't learn, a, I don't make a path. What happens? If I want to learn how to handle an insult, if I don't ever learn it or my path goes this way, because what I do is I run away, right? Or I go lock myself in my room and I keep doing this path over and over again, then I've solidified kind of a solution to something that may not be the most efficient. Does that make sense? And that's what it's like in regards to brain development. So again, let's think about the children that we serve. Um, And just in regards to the amount of time caregivers have to support the development of alternate routes, even for anything, right, whether it's how to resolve conflict, how to develop friendships, because not, there's not one way to do it, right? There's multiple ways, depending on kind of the environment and the situation. But if I only learn one way, what happens? Especially if that one way fails one time. Do you think I'll try that way again if I'm a young child? No, right? And so think about the kids that we work with. Are they given those opportunities to learn multiple ways to get from point A to point B? Um, or do we... Um, And think about our at-risk populations. What's the likelihood that they learn any way to get from point A to point B? So we joke all the time, and I'm sure you guys have heard this kind of, in the juvenile justice system, what we see is if a child wakes up late for school, what do you think is a typical solution for them? They don't go, right? So, but there are many solutions to that situation, just like there is if you wake up late for work, right? And so it's, but, you know, they, I mean, you could, you know, call your tia, you could take the school bus, you could, I mean, the city bus, you could call the school and someone will come get you. There's all these options, right? But they go, oh, I was late. And poof, they're, they're done for the day, right? And that's what we're talking about is learning many options to a solution. But those have to be solidified. And it's, it can be done at any time. I'm not saying it's impossible. But these are some critical time periods you know, following these kind of growth spurts where you can get optimal learning. And again, think about our population and whether that occurs. 